I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Jonah chapter 2. Jonah 2 is our text, and if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 920, and you will find Jonah chapter 2 right there. And, uh, and follow along with us. And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible uh, and you want one, take one of those with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, message us. We'll be glad to get you one, whether we have to mail it to you or deliver it to you. We want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, obviously, I am not preaching alone this weekend. I don't know if you noticed that or not, but there's some other people on the stage, so, uh, and they're getting applause, and they, you guys don't even know who they are. So, uh, so let me introduce my fellow presenters, if you will. So seated to my right is Joanna Magdaleno. Uh, she is a, a, a counselor, a public health social worker. Uh, she has a master's in social work, and she also happens to be married to our, our Parker campus pastor, Ruben Magdaleno. And the next to her is Valerie Pruitt. Uh, Valerie is a, uh, well, she's a worship arts, uh, uh, what's the t- coordinator? coordinator. You know, she runs this department, basically. Uh, she's also working on her master's in social work, and she happens to be married to our lead worship pastor, Jesse Pruitt. And uh, he's not even here, and he gets cheers. Uh, anyway, so I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, that was Jesse. Okay, he was cheering. And then to their right is uh, Patrick Bowen, and Patrick is our Celebrate Recovery Pastor for the last... <laughs> we are! We are! Okay, and uh, he's also a, uh, his other job is he's a physical therapist. Uh, so uh, thank you for just joining me and being willing to, to help share uh, Jonah chapter two. I asked him to help uh, explain, if you will, help preach the, the truths in Jonah chapter 2. If, you, if you're not familiar with the story of Jonah, we started last week. You can go back and listen to a great sermon uh, Pastor Pete shared. But uh, God told Jonah to go preach to Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to do that, so he went the opposite direction, got on the ship, sailed away. Uh, God sent a storm. The sailors couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and Jonah said, hey, if you want to appease God, throw me overboard. They threw him overboard. Uh, he really had just given up. And so they threw him overboard, and then... Uh, Jonah thought he was dead. I mean, here's a guy who probably doesn't know how to swim in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a storm, and he probably thought, okay, here's the end of my life. I'm done for. And then God sent a big fish to swallow him. And uh, I don't want to argue about the, the, the physical possibilities. Just realize he's God. He created everything. Uh, he can make a fish to swallow a guy. And, and Jonah, who thought he was dead, who had given up, suddenly realizes that he's alive in a fish. He didn't drown. He didn't die. Um, But it's kind of a hopeless place to be. Doesn't smell very good. Uh, You don't have any plans on how to get out of there. There's no, like, classes on how to extricate yourself from the belly of a fish. And uh, he can sense it's going down, down, down. He's underwater, and he's hopeless. And so he did what all of us do when we get desperate. He prayed. Jonah chapter 2. I want you to hear the words of Jonah as he prays them from the belly of the fish. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will repay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, 
and it vomited Jonah on dry land. What a great passage, isn't it? <laughs> Starts off being swallowed by a fish, ends being, you know, fish vomit, and uh, in the in between time, Jonah prays. Now, the first thing that jumps out to me that I want you to see is that desperation is motivation for life change. Yeah. Desperation is motivation for life change. Uh, Jonah says, look, I, I called out to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried out and you heard my voice. Sheol is the place of the dead. It's often translated Hades or sometimes hell. He's like, you can't be in a worse place than this. I called out to you from that place. In, in verse 7, he says, my life was fainting away. My life is over. It's going away. Uh, so let me ask my, my friends that are up here that uh, I invited to join us. What was your moment, your experience of desperation that began your journey of life change? Uh, Joanna? Uh, for me, it was when I, when I went to jail. Now, it wasn't the day that I was arrested. It actually was a couple of days after that when, you know, the drugs wore off, and I came to the realization of where I was at, and all the emotions just started to hit me. I started to feel everything, all of the guilt, all of the shame, everything, I, it was unbearable. I felt like I just, I couldn't breathe anymore. And that was the first time that I felt desperate, desperate enough to call on God. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. <laughs> Val, how about you? Yeah, so um, mine was not facilitated by a fish, but rather a car. Like Jonah, I was running. Um, I ran out of our house, got in our car, and drove away. My husband and I had been on the phone with a friend who was helping us to um, come to terms with the fact that I had just blown up our life. Um, I was under investigation at the hospital where I worked for drug diversion. And in that moment, I just remember feeling so much shame that I didn't want to look into the eyes of my husband or anybody else. So I ran out of the house. I turned off the location device on my phone, um, got in the car, and I drove actually out towards Sarah Park and parked at um, one of the trailheads. And there in the quiet, um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and right there I surrendered to God fully and completely. I started to face um, the things that I had done. My drug addiction had gone so out of control that I was desperate for God to save me, and in that moment, he did. Mm. Amen. Patrick, how about you? What's your moment of desperation where you called out to God? So I don't really have a moment that I can point to. Mine's more of a season. So my, my season of desperation became, uh, really started uh, about four years ago. I was on the heels of my last of many extramarital affairs, and uh, thankfully at the end of about a 20-year pornography addiction that started when I was a kid, and um, I really realized that, uh, that my life was a mess. Um, I was super depressed. I was, um, I was living two totally separate lives. You know, I, I was living a life that, uh, that I wanted to project to my family, to my friends, to the people that I went to church with. And then I had this other life that not a whole lot of people knew about. And quite frankly, I was exhausted from living two lives. Um, I uh, was blaming everybody around me for everything that had happened instead of taking responsibility for my poor choices, and uh, I was extremely depressed. In fact, um, I, was, uh, I had already made a plan to end my life. Um, thankfully, uh, this didn't happen, but uh, really, I, uh, I had started smoking, uh, smoking marijuana every day. I was trying to alter my reality and escape through substances uh, because really I just, I hated my life and I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna do this anymore. I really just wanted relief. I wanted the pain to stop. Mm. So, yeah. Desperation is that, that motivation for life change. It drives us to the place where we're willing to call out to God. And, and the second thing we see in Jonah's story is that God hears and answers our cry for help. He hears and he answers our cry for help. Jonah says that as he begins his prayer. I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. 
God hears you when you cry out, and he answers you. And by the way, the Bible is full of stories and promises and psalms of God uh, answering prayers of psalmists and, and others stating that God hears and answers his people. Just some of my favorites, Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and mighty things that you don't even know about. That's God's invitation to you, by the way, to all of us, all of his people. And, and then uh, Jesus echoes that when he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Now, what I love is uh, the, the picture of it when uh, Jesus is walking on the water and, and the apostle Peter says, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, okay, get out of the boat and come here. And Peter starts walking on the water. Incredible miracle, except in the midst of that, he loses his eyes on Jesus. He takes them off Jesus, puts them on the wind and the waves, starts freaking out, starts sinking, and what does he do? He cries out in desperation to Jesus, save me. Jesus saves him. Grabs him and saves him. So uh, God hears and answers our cry for help. So my question to my friends is, in your desperation, you cried out to God. Obviously, he heard you and he answered you. But how did you know, how did you experience God's answer in your life? How did you know he heard you? Uh, Patrick. All right. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a church uh, where my dad was a pastor. We lived next door in the parsonage. And I became... No, I, I don't know. I'm not clapping for that. I'll tell you why. So I, I became a professional hypocrite, really. So there were a lot of expectations placed on me by, by my dad's ministry work. And um, I became really good at playing church. And, you know, I did that for years and essentially uh, became a master at living two separate lives, which is, as I've already discussed, was, was why I was so exhausted and sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know what I mean? So... Um, it's really no surprise, you know, looking back, and even, even when I was in my moment of desperation or season of desperation, if you will, I was serving here at Calvary on the worship team, right? Totally living two lives. A lot of people had no idea uh, the things that I was doing outside of, uh, of my church service. And um, thankfully, that uh, me serving on the worship arts team placed a really important influence in my life. Our worship pastor, Jesse Pruitt, who I, I developed a, a close relationship to, um, you know, early on, um, you know, he kind of he saw that, uh, that there were some things missing in my life. Um, and, you know, just, just to, to piggyback on, on the, the, the redemption that their family received, you know, he, he had just walked through this season of healing and, and restoration with his wife. And, uh, you know, did you know, guys, recovery sometimes is contagious? Thank goodness it's contagious. And uh, since he'd walked through that, he saw what an opportunity there was for God to make a huge, uh, huge thing happen in my life. And he, at, he told me, he said, hey, you need to go check out this thing called Celebrate Recovery. And I told him, no, I'm, I'm not one of those people. So, uh, so he kept asking me, and I finally agreed to go, and I said, well, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to go to Calvary Celebrate Recovery because... I don't want anybody to know, you know, that I got problems, right? <laughs> so I went to one of the other Celebrate Recoveries in town, and I, and I went for about three weeks, and uh, the last time that I was there, I, I, I was sitting, sitting out in the, in the audience, and, and, and this guy was preaching with, uh, with a New York accent, and he was just, I felt like I was the only one in the room, he was talking right to me, and I knew, you know, right then that I had to make a change, and I, I, that I couldn't keep on doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. For those of you that aren't in the, in the, in the recovery uh, circle, we call that insanity, okay? Um, and I realized that I had to take a step and admit that I had a problem and step out of denial, so that's what I did. That night I went and got a blue chip, a surrender chip, and I stayed after, and I spoke with him for what felt like uh, a day and a half. It was really probably like an hour, but I told him everything I'd ever done, and I just unloaded all that stuff. And uh, you guys ever had a stomach virus, <laughs> right? And you, you sick at your stomach, and you feel like you're gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna be sick, and, and you, you know, that, that pressure just builds, and you have this sickening pit in your stomach, and you know that there's only one thing that can relieve that sick feeling <laughs> in your stomach, right? So you asked me what, what it felt like. That's what it felt like. It felt like I really needed to throw up for about 33 years, and then fi I finally threw up, and um, 
and I felt a little better, but you know, sometimes that sickness lingers. And, and the same was true in my life. I went home that night and I, I was out in my yard and I was, I was just, I was thinking about everything that had happened and realizing, you know, my gosh, I'm a sex addict. You know, and that's a, that's a hard thing to swallow when you don't realize that, that you are, you know? And um, I was looking up in the stars and I, t- I told God, I said, listen, I, I, am, I am so tired of doing life this way. And, you know, I know I've doubted you for a long time and I, didn't, I don't know if you're real, but if you're real and if you'll save me, I'll give my life to you. And guys, he did. Yeah. And I did. So, um, so for me, it was like it was like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. You know, I felt um, I felt at peace. I, I had um, I, I felt I knew that I didn't have any idea what was about to happen. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know uh, what I needed to do next. I didn't, but I felt I knew and I knew deep in my heart that no matter what happened, that God was gonna see me through it. Yeah. Because I had that peace that passes understanding. And, um, and yeah, so that's, that's what that was like. Just, uh, just you, can't, you can't even explain the peace that I felt when I, after I did that. Amen, all right, thank you. Val, how about you? How, yeah. did, how did you know and experience God's answer? So I have to answer this question in two ways. I experienced um, God's answer through surrender. Uh, to the process of healing, which for me included inpatient rehab. Um, And I had a dual diagnosis of PTSD for previous trauma and obviously substance abuse disorder. Um, I felt that surrender, especially about eight days in, you know, I finally got a call in with my husband and we both simultaneously decided that I would need to stay there as long as it took, 30 days, two months, nine years, whatever it took. So it ended up being three months, and it was a great privilege to be there because I was able to get the therapy that I really needed um, for decades. And then I was also given that beautiful, special time set aside with God, who helped restore my soul while I was there, and it was really beautiful. Secondly, um, God's rescue was really evident when I walked into a courtroom to be sentenced for my crimes. I felt a great amount of remorse for the pain and destruction I caused, for sure, but I also was able to walk in confidence into that courtroom, knowing that God fully had forgiven me, and I didn't need to carry the shame anymore. So um, I was able to walk in with a sense of peace, and whether I was going to be sentenced to prison or probation, I had already had my nursing license, I already lost my nursing license, which I deserved, which in fact, if you're a sinner, we all deserve hell, we all deserve death, but because of Jesus and the price he paid with, for, uh, for us with his blood, I was able to be freed from that. Um, and now Amen. I have an eternity with him. So anyway, I walked in there knowing whatever consequences that I faced and because of the proximity proximity to me my family would face, we could do it full well with God knowing that he would lead us through it, and he did. Amen. Amen. So, Joanna, how about you? Uh, You know God heard you and he answered you, but how did you experience that answer? When I surrendered my life to God in jail, I really meant it. It wasn't just a jailhouse conversion like a lot of people think like oh i'm just you know gonna repent in here and 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 bargain and bargain with god i didn't i actually i didn't bargain with god i completely surrendered because i was done doing that i i had been bargaining not just with god but just my my entire life and so when when i gave my life to god in there i really really meant it and I knew that I meant it because I asked him for two things I asked him please forgive me forgive me of my sins and then I asked him to restore my family I didn't ask him to take my sentence away because I knew that whatever sentence I got I deserved and more 
And I didn't ask him for that. And trust me, he didn't take my sentence away. I had, a, I had to go to jail for 18 months and I had to do probation for three years and pay restitution and all of that. I still had to pay that, but I, I knew that I deserved that. And actually that was mercy. Mm -hmm. It really was. So I knew that God had heard me and the way that I experienced his peace, the way that I experienced that he was with me was because for the first time in my life, while I was in jail, I experienced freedom. Mm. And that is a weird place to experience freedom <laughs> is in jail while you're behind <laughs> bars. But I didn't really realize that my entire life I had been a prisoner, a prisoner to my own sin and to my own destruction. And it took me to go to jail to experience God's freedom. Yeah. Amen. Um, hey, can I just, can I just point out that they all knew that God answered them, but he didn't fix the problems that were right in front of them. Uh, Patrick used the word of season of desperation. Uh, so God answers us, he hears us, and he answers us, but sometimes uh, it's a season that we're in. Uh, Jonah cried out to God, God heard him, but uh, God didn't deliver him immediately. He was in the belly of that fish for three days. And you gotta know that for two days and about 59, or, you know, 12, 23 hours and 59 minutes, he was wondering, is this it? But either way, he, uh, he still did something really crazy. He concluded his prayer with a declaration of faith. Did you catch that? He said, before he was saved, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord, which, which is an interesting thing to declare when you're in the belly of a fish on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so he prayed this before the fish vomited Jonah out. Jonah trusted God before he experienced the rescue. Now, there's a lot of times that we want to kind of bargain and we want to kind of say, God, if you'll save me, if you'll rescue me, I'll believe in you. It, but you just heard three stories where they surrendered without condition to God. They gave up before God manifest his redemption in their lives. Uh, and I, I think that's huge. So I'm going to ask you this. You guys all experienced God's deliverance. You all experienced God's rescue, his salvation. So what would you share with people who are in similar places that you found yourselves when you cried out to God? What would you tell people who are desperate today? Uh, well, let's start with you. Yeah. I love this question. So salvation becomes real if you surrender. Transparency used to be um, an enemy of mine, but now, ironically, it's one of God's greatest tools to keep me accountable to him and to others. Um, and I'm thriving in it. In fact, if you ask some people, I'm probably too honest. <laughs> nope. <laughs> in my addiction, um, I knew that I was hurting others. I was hurting my family. I was hurting my friends. And um, still, I was breaking God's heart in that. With all of that, I still wasn't able to break free of the lies and walking in that deceit. And um, I remember sitting in Pastor Chad's office at the beginning of all this before I had gone to rehab, and I was like ugly crying and just raw and open and vulnerable and, um, you know, talking to Chad about how bad my addiction had come or how bad my addiction had become. And um, my husband was sitting next to me like he always does and he always will. And even though in that moment I was like, I felt very exposed and um, humiliated, I was in surrender. So it was beautiful and it was excruciating because in that moment, in that room, speaking to two men that I highly respected and cared about. I was walking in that freedom and um, I was met with acceptance and grace and forgiveness and the best of all, hope. I knew I had hope. 
And that's why I said yes to Pastor Chad to sit up on this panel, not because I love public speaking, trust me, I don't, um, but it's because I will always take up an opportunity to show what God's power can do and what a life can look like fully surrendered to him. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So Joanna, how about you? I didn't think that forgiveness was available to me because of all of the awful things that I had done in my life. I didn't feel worthy, um, but that's a lie because you see, God didn't show up like a magic genie in that jail cell when I called out to him. The truth is that he had always been with me. He was with me when I was getting high in bathrooms. He was with me when I was cheating on my husband. He was with me when I was neglecting my kids. And he was with me that day in that jail cell. He was patiently waiting for me the way he's waiting for you as well. And I just want to tell you today that salvation is available to you. Amen. Don't be a fool like me and Jonah and wait until you're confined to a dark place and stinky as well to finally <laughs> surrender. Salvation is available for you. Amen. Amen. Okay, Patrick. So what would you share with people who are desperate? You know, Henry David Thoreau has a quote. Um, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And I, I think that quote is often misused because, because a lot of people think, oh, well, well, that means that you should get after it and go get the things that you want. And if you know Thoreau, then you know that that's not what he meant at all. And uh, while I don't always agree with his theology, in fact, never, but you... Uh, <laughs> I think one thing that he did get right is, is that the pursuit of material things and material pleasure is empty. And I think in my life, I, I, I didn't realize that I had a problem because I saw everyone else around me doing the same thing. Um, yeah, my, my, my dysfunction was, was not healthy, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, in case you guys uh, think that my story is unique, it isn't. I actually read a study yesterday that 61% uh, of women aged 18 to 72 have used pornography in the last one month. And guys, just in case you think I'm on the women, 91% of men aged 18 to 72 have used pornography in the last month, if you look at all modalities. So um, I know that my story is not unique. I know that this is something that people struggle with. And, uh, and, but, but I also know that I was seeking comfort for something um, that happened to me when I was young that, that I, I really had never dealt with. And, and uh, guys, I'm here to tell you that, that, that we all walk around with hurt. We all walk around with things that we carry from, from times that, that really weren't our fault. And um, don't think that you're alone in that. Uh, even if you don't remember what it was, a lot of, I'll tell you this, a lot of the memories that I have were repressed until I got into my, uh, in, in, into the, working the steps, you know, through celibate recovery. <laughs> um, and uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, that it doesn't matter what you're, see what you're seeking, you know, and, and we have a tendency to replace comfort with something else that gives us comfort. And, um, you know, for me, my dysfunction was really comfortable for me. I, I was used to it, so that's what I did. You know, I didn't know any other way of living other than living two lives, you know. It was totally normal. But it doesn't matter if you're, if you're, if you're, seek, if you're looking, looking uh, to, to fill that, that, uh, that search for satisfaction with, with alcohol, with, with sex like I did, with, uh, with next year models, uh, you know, next year's uh, newest model car, with... Uh, with that side-by-side -side you've really been wanting, with that big house, with the six RV garages, with whatever it is, um, you know, we have, a, we have this, uh, this search for materialism in our, in our nation. And, and oftentimes we, we equate success um, with, with purpose. And, and guys, it's not the, it, that's not the same thing. And I'll tell you that if you're not, if you're not chasing Jesus, 
if you're not seeking a relationship with him, if you're not looking to, to stop fighting against the current that is God's will for your life, you're, you're not gonna be successful. You're not gonna have purpose. You're not gonna find satisfaction. And guys, there is a God-shaped hole in every one of our hearts that only he can fill. And every other pursuit is really just noise. So I'll say this, every single Monday night at 6.30, we meet right here in this room. And if you're here tonight and you have a sin problem, okay, which I'm pretty sure all of us do, okay, then you belong at Celebrate Recovery, okay? If you've got hurts, habits, or hangups, then you belong at Celebrate Recovery, okay? Guys, don't think that you have to have a chemical issue to come to Celebrate Recovery. Don't think that you have to be in a moment of desperation to come to Celebrate Recovery, okay? Because Celebrate Recovery truly is for everyone, and it's not just for people that have drug and alcohol issues. Um, guys, the 12 steps provides a framework to really look at your life and, and, and look inside and see what's going on. Not, not so that you can, uh, you know, that you can join some kind of special exclusive club, although I, I think it's a great group of people to be a part of, you know. Um, but it gives us the tools that we need to really grow in a relationship with Christ and to grow closer to him. So, um, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. I'll be here on Monday, you guys should too. Hey. Now, if you're new to Calvary, you may be wondering, uh, is it strange for uh, so many people with uh, such wild and terrible pasts to be part of uh, our staff? The answer is no, it's not. Uh, see, the reality is we, one of our core values is uncomfortable grace. Uncomfortable grace. And we believe that the, the mercy of Christ, that is forgiveness of sins, all of our sins are wiped away. And that doesn't just apply to you, it applies to everyone else as well. That, that God's grace for you is complete, but it also applies to the person sitting next to you. It applies to the people that you love. It applies to the people that you despise. It applies to all of us. And as already been said, uh, salvation is, is only through Jesus. It's only through Jesus. And, and, and so uh, I want you to hear that. I want you to know that. Uh, I want you to feel that. I want you to believe that. I want you to hold on to that. Uh, and, uh, and I want you to, to know that. By the way, a couple of things in case you, you want to hear more. Uh, all of their testimony videos are going to be posted on our website in conjunction with this message. So you'll be able to send these to your friends or uh, invite them to watch them. Or if you haven't heard their stories before, uh, you can go and watch and get the whole thing. Uh, and then uh, they're also going to be available at the end of the service. So our prayer team is going to be here at the front. They're going to be here at the front as part of the prayer team uh, this weekend. And so if you need to talk with them, let them pray with you uh, after the service, they're available. And they would love to, uh, to minister to you. And uh, so if one of their stories resonates with you, then uh, certainly uh, allow them to, to talk with you tonight, tomorrow, uh, whenever. Uh, we also have a table set up in the foyer about Celebrate Recovery. We may have mentioned that once or twice tonight. Uh, and uh, you may have heard some people cheering for it. I wasn't sure if we were gonna get through the sermon on time because of the pauses on Celebrate Recovery, which I am completely for. But uh, let, me just, let me just tell you, it's a big part of our ministry here at Calvary. And, uh, and as Patrick said, everyone could benefit from Celebrate Recovery. Now, you've heard their stories of desperation and how God delivered them. You've heard Jonah's story of desperation and how God delivered him. I gotta ask you, are you desperate enough to surrender? Are you desperate enough to surrender to Jesus? I mean, if you're here and you've never confessed Jesus as Savior and Lord and, and you've just been going through the motions, playing the game, or maybe you've been checking it out, would you make that decision today? It, it begins by surrendering to Jesus, saying, I need you, I can't do this without you, I give up. I give up. He'll meet you here and he'll change your life. And if you do that today, we would love to know about it. Come and pray with the prayer team, come find a pastor, fill out a connect card, uh, 
email us and let us know if you're online. We want to celebrate with you. We want to help you take those next steps. But what about for those of you who are followers of Christ that are stuck? And maybe you're desperate, or maybe you're managing your pain and you think it's manageable. Uh, are you desperate enough to ask for help? Whether it's to come and pray with someone tonight here at the front, whether it's to show up Monday night at Celebrate Recovery, whether it is to seek counseling, hey, whether it's to confess to someone that you trust. Whatever the case is, if you want to find deliverance, then you gotta get desperate enough to ask for help. Now, I wanna remind you one last thing and we're gonna pray. We're in chapter two of Jonah. Obviously, his story isn't over. But here's what I want you to know. Wherever you are, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, God can redeem. Your story isn't over. And if you don't like where it is right now, then I'd encourage you to get desperate enough to cry out to God for help. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for salvation because it's found only in Jesus. It's found only in you. And you are always waiting for us to trust you. You're always inviting us to come running home, crying for help, reaching out, begging for mercy, because you're the God who's going to save us, who's gonna forgive us, who's gonna bless us, who's gonna grab us and hold us tight uh, and let us know that everything's gonna be okay. Because Jesus has paid for our rebellion and you've invited us to become children of the living God by faith. So Father, I pray that this message of hope would resonate with every single heart, whether they're in the room or online. Father, I pray that you would meet people here and you would fill them with that expectation of deliverance simply because they've seen the lives of others who were desperate changed. So Father, thank you that you never give up on us. And I pray that every single person that's part of this worship experience would not give up on themselves or on you. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.